uh, let me know where you're from and uh, and your name. And also, I guess, let me know if you can hear me clearly or I sound a little awkward or muffled. Um, still getting reports that I sound muffled. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Maybe it's just her. Let's hope it's just her. I can change headphones, perhaps. Uh, I think I have another pair here somewhere. So they drop things. Hello, hello. Welcome, welcome. Hopefully you guys can hear me okay, yes? Uh, let me know where you are, where you're from. Say hello. A little weird for the audio. Weird. Okay. All right. I may pop in and pop out. Um, let's see. Jeff, let me swap out these headphones and see if this works better. Is that better, Jeff? I understand you. This is better? You, you put yes question mark. Is this better, guys? No, it's the same. All right, let me pop out and pop back in um, and see if that helps. Hopefully. Uh, is this better? Perfect. Okay. I'm so sorry about that. Uh, much, much better. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Minor, worse. Grace, we, I sound worse? Oh, my God. I'm super stressed now. All right. Let me go back a little bit. Grace, how do I sound? Yes, yes, better. Okay, perfect. What's up? What's up? We're three minutes past the hour. We will make it back, I swear. Let me give some quick shout-outs, as always, um, to, to some people. Uh, so let's see here. Paramesh, hello, welcome, welcome all the way from India. It's late your time, no, or is it morning your time? But thank you so much for joining. Ivan is here. Yes, we are grateful to have you, so we appreciate. Uh, hi, Jody from Bristol. Uh, Katie O'Dunn is here. I'm supposed to say that sweeter. Katie is a friend, maybe my girlfriend. Hi, Katie. Always, okay, anyway, it's always awkward to say hi to you, Katie. Hi, Kate. Hi, Kate. <clears throat> I'll figure it out. Uh, hi, Christina. Hi, Christine. Uh, of course, Grace. Hi, Bree from Madison. George Anthony from Durham, North Carolina. Nick, what's up, Nick in Colorado? Anissa, hey, Anissa, hope you're well. Snow White in Portland. Edu, 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 I've seen you here before, though, in Miami, my old hometown. Um, and everybody's saying you're fine as of now. And Stacy Conroy is here. Hello, Mary in Central California. Okay. Well, we did it. We killed our two minutes with uh, technical difficulty. So let's jump right into the action. This is very, very exciting. Hope everyone's doing good tonight. Um, I know it's been a minute, two weeks, in fact, since we talked last. So I'm excited to be here and I'm excited that you're here too. Uh, let me just get through the, uh, the necessities of the things that I have to say, and then we can get to the things that I don't have to say. And I'm sure that'll be interesting. So uh, for those of you that don't know, my name is Ethan Smith. I'm the National Ambassador for the International OCD Foundation, uh, which simply means I have OCD and represent the foundation in all things advocacy and media. Um, just some quick housekeeping. This town hall is intended to serve, this is not a town hall, but this is just Ethan. It's intended to serve as educational content, not intended to replace therapy, especially because I'm not a therapist. Uh, for treatment related questions, please be sure to work with your local provider or contact a local clinician. The International OCD Foundation is not a crisis hotline. It should not be used if you are in distress or feeling unsafe. If you are in crisis or you're ever feeling suicidal or unsafe, Jess, this is blocking my mouth. Oh, this is so bad. No, I'm kidding. Leave it up. <laughs> wow, now I'm a jerk. But do the do the thing with the square, the 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 thing where I I I I the, the no okay. Um, I promise you now, Katie is rolling her eyes at me, and I'll probably get a text. This if you're in crisis, you're ever feeling suicidal or unsafe, please go to your local emergency room, call nine one one, or call the suicide prevention hotline at 800-273-8255. We always want to be, let's see, we always want to be respectful and kind. So, uh, <laughs> Katie, I'm definitely rolling my eyes. Of course you are. Je uh, Jess, do you have the other format where I become like a little bit more of a window? So when we put questions up, it doesn't block um, me. Or actually, I can change. Maybe that will help. Okay. Um, where was I? Uh, we always want to be respectful and kind of others. This is a public... Um, 
form that is being recorded and we'll live on the interwebs for, oh my God, Patricia Hatcher. Hey, Pat, what's up? Anyway, uh, good to see you. Uh, this will live on the interwebs for all to see. So um, I always want to be open and honest and vulnerable and sincere with all of you and you with me, but always keep in mind that this is public and will be viewed. So if you say something that's sensitive, um, please know that it will be public, but always try to be respectful and kind of others. With that in mind, I hope everyone is doing really great tonight. Um, I'm having an interesting week, and uh, I'm excited to share some things in my life with you in an effort to have a conversation. As always, we will get to question and answer um, probably sooner rather than later. I'm really looking forward to having a, um, a conversation with all of you like we did last week or last couple of weeks. I, it was really, really good, and I look forward to having one this week as well. But I'd like to start it off with um, some personal stories and some things that I'm going through because um, I like to keep it real with all of you. And um, and then maybe you can share with me what's going on and we will go from there. So uh, first of all, real quick, hi, Valerie Andrews, who's amazing. Hi, Thomas. Patricia, I know you're in Florida. It's awesome to see you, Patricia. And, uh, and hi, Caroline. And hi, Beth Ann. So... Today I wrote comfort zones and values, and and what does that mean? As you know, I like to ramble, and I don't make notes per se, so I like to keep things really organic and 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 even. Um, and that's a great question, Nick. I'll answer that in uh, momentarily. So thank you for that. And that goes for anybody. Please, if you have questions, please feel free to go ahead and ask them. Um, and and as soon as I'm done um, rambling, <laughs> I will I will absolutely answer any and all questions I can. Um, in an effort to have a really good, healthy conversation with all of you. But um, the reason I wanted to talk about comfort zones and values and how they relate to each other. So a comfort zone, and again, this is just my layman belief of what a comfort zone and values are, is you know, comfort zone is, is basically where you're comfortable in the things that you're doing and the actions that you're engaging in. And for instance, I am not a basketball player. So if you put me on a basketball team um, and said play basketball, I would be out of my comfort zone. Um, and out of my mind. So little known fact, I can slam dunk though. That's not true. And then uh, also comfort zones in terms of values. How do comfort zone relate to values? And how do comfort zones and values relate back to OCD, OCD treatment, OCD therapy, and eventually getting to a place of recovery and maintenance and living a value-driven life? So in essence, we hear all the time with exposure and response prevention therapy that you know, we want to live toward our values. And if you're compulsing, you are not living toward your values. You're doing what OCD asks you to do. And OCD wants you to do the complete opposite of what your values are. OCD and the presence of compulsing and you choosing values cannot exist simultaneously. They're both mutually exclusive. So you get to choose one or the other. You get to choose either what OCD wants you to do or you get to choose what's important for you. And Oftentimes, in treatment, in therapy, and outside of treatment and therapy, in life, your values take you out of your comfort zone. For instance, everything that we're going through right now with uh, the pandemic and race and all of that, for many of us, is out of our comfort zone. Life right now is not particularly comfortable for a lot of people. Um, and we are having multiple discussions about, about that. But in an effort to resolve some of these discomforts, we're working toward our values. We're having candid conversations and necessary conversations around, around race and inclusion and equity that we weren't having before, much larger, much louder conversations, um, conversations that were necessary or that are necessary. Um, the pandemic you know, um, has taken us all out of our comfort zone of where we were and what we were doing and our routines and our life and put us in a place that some of us feel like we're flailing, others are thriving. But regardless, um, you know, we're definitely sort of outside of our comfort zone and all the new things that we're doing. And so why, why would I ever wanna go outside of my comfort zone? Why is it important to go outside of your comfort zone? And I'm gonna ask you this question as well, if you wanna answer it, why is it important to go out of your comfort zone and why, and if you have an example of things that you've done or are doing that you're going outside of your comfort zone to head in the direction of your values, um, I want to hear about it and let me know because what we know and what we've learned and what I've learned in life is that growth comes from discomfort and, and growth comes from going outside of 
your comfort zone. And you've, we've all, some of us have seen that, that, that picture of, you know, that circles the comfort zone and then the, you are here is over here and growth and all that. And I always said, you know, if I could grow by sitting, you know, on a beach in Fiji, drinking a pina colada, virgin pina colada, no alcohol, um, then that would be fantastic. I would love to grow sitting on a beach, but unfortunately that's not where growth comes from. And I can look at my own personal journey with OCD and tell you that the majority of my growth as a man, as a human being, learning my values, what's important to me, what's really important about life has come from the tragedies and the obstacles that we've all, all of us here, not Ethan, all of us here have had to overcome. And I know you all can relate to that in some way. Um, hi, Raquel in Puerto Rico. Um, it's great. I'm glad you made it. Raquel's an awesome friend. She know, definitely knows all about um, overcoming and values and comfort zones and all of those things. Um, to everyone struggling, this is a growing pain. That's right. To become comfortable with uncomfortability, you will prevail because it helps us grow. I went back to college when I was 44 years old. I had the best time of my life. That's awesome, Mary. And that's the thing. I mean, you know, you might have been married nervous up to that point. Well, what people think, well, I'd be the oldest person in the class. Uh, but then you get there and you do it for you. And that's really, you know, what it's about. Fighting OCD every day with ERP in my comfort zone is exhausting. That's true, too. And I want to talk about that as well. Hey, Jonathan from Illinois. So, so I want to talk a little bit about my own comfort zone. Um, two, two specific things, just to let you know. I like these Just Ethan's because I get to be as real with you as you are with me. So last week I went on vacation um, with my girlfriend and and uh, we went to a, uh, a lake house in the middle of nowhere, Alabama. We had a great time, but we did a lot of stuff that was really out of my comfort zone. Um, I I'm a fan of uh, I'm a fan of um, room service and uh, and and hotels. And uh, although this was a lovely house on a lake, but it was a pretty outdoorsy experience. She's probably laughing at me right now because it wasn't outdoorsy other than going outside, but that's outdoorsy. You go outside, that's outdoorsy. But um, I'd never swum in a lake before, which may sound ridiculous, but I've, no, I've never swum in a lake before. Um, and of course my OCD was extremely triggered and spiked. Um, what's in the lake, what can kill me in the lake. I had just read about the, the brain eating bacteria that some kid in Florida got. And I was like, oh my God, what if I swallow water? What if it goes up my nose? What if it goes in my ears? All the, all the good quality OCD thoughts that uh, we all know and love to hear. Um, and there were a number of other things that were outside of my comfort zone too. My girlfriend, is a, Katie, is, a, uh, is an endurance athlete and a swimmer and a runner. All of those things are out of my comfort zone, by the way. I am a sitter and an eater and a lover, not a fighter, as we all know. Um, and so, you know, um, a lot of these things were outside of my comfort zone and they gave me anxiety. And so the question would become, well, why did I do them then? Why, why did I get in the lake every day? Um, we saw a water moccasin uh, on the bank of the lake, a big sucker, a poisonous snake. Why did I still get in the lake when my OCD was screaming, he's going to eat you and bite you and kill you. And there's, an, there's not a hospital anywhere close to where we were. We we're like 30 minutes away from anything at all. So the question I pose to you and myself is why? Why would I do that? Why, why would I get out of my comfort zone and give myself anxiety? Well, again, that ties in perfectly to this idea of values and what's important um, to me personally and what's important to, to you personally. You know, for me, um, I value relationships and I value, um, you know, I value uh, the person that I'm in love with and I value... Um, I value love and relationships and life. And, and these are all newer experiences for me. Um, you know, up until 31 years old, I lived for OCD and really didn't live a, a, an adult life. So, you know, I may be 42 now, but I'm in the process of really still engaging what it means to live an adult life, right? And I'm, I'm okay saying that. I'm very comfortable where I am now in my own life and what age I am and what I'm doing and the things, who I am. This, you know, in the last year and a half, I've started to become really comfortable with where I am in life right now. And all the, yes, it made me anxious and all of the above, but you know what? My values were like, you value love, you value friendship, you value health, you value exercise, you value um, connection to nature, you value spirituality. And had I not done any of the things that I did, I would, I would be letting anxiety, even though it's not specifically OCD, I would let anxiety dictate my actions and not living in accordance with my values. And so at the end of the day, yeah, I had anxiety every day at different points and I had tons of OCD thoughts around a variety of things, but 
I can look back and go, I had a great vacation despite OCD, despite anxiety, because I got to do things that I hadn't necessarily done before. And as we know with OCD, some of the simplest things for most people are really difficult for us. Um, I think people that don't have a mental illness, um, you know, take a lot of simple things for granted. Getting out of bed is a really hard thing to do sometimes for a lot of us. Um, you know, and a lot of people don't think twice about getting out of bed or walking or feeding yourself or, or you know, any little task is actually can feel like an insurmountable task for many of us. So for me, um, this, even though it was a vacation, and I was going to relax, it was very much out of my comfort zone for a number of reasons. And, um, but it was a thousand percent worth it. And I would do it all over again because of the lessons that I learned and being comfortable being uncomfortable. And sometimes I wasn't even, I was uncomfortable being uncomfortable, but you still did it and you still, you still had it and you still, um, you still went through the process. Um, and so for me, that's just a, a, a quick example of why getting out of your comfort zone is important and how it coincides directly and applies to your values. Um, I can also play in my head, uh, what if I had avoided or not done or not done the things? How would I have felt? Would that have relieved the anxiety in the moment? Probably. Would have, it would have silenced the thoughts a little bit and, and lowered the anxiety, the, the heaviness in my chest and then the nausea and the, the sweats and the heart racing. But but, but two, three hours later, how would I have felt? How would I have felt about myself? How would I have felt about my decisions choosing um, to go against my values and what I value as, as, as an individual? And, and, and being able to recognize how that choice plays out and use that to inspire me to make a choice that may be uncomfortable in the moment, but really benefits me growing as a human being in the long run. And so being able to have that perspective and be able to say, you know what, if I don't do this, how am I going to feel afterwards? Geez, I don't, I don't think I'm going to like that feeling very much. Um, so I'm going to take a chance and do this anyway. Um, I've got one more quick little anecdote to share with you, just a, um, a, a personal thing that I'm going through at the moment. It may not be a big deal to some, but when I was growing up with, with, with really bad OCD, one of my, one of my symptoms, if you will, uh, was dizziness. Um, and, and I've talked about it some, mostly you hear about my self-harm fears and things like that, but most of my high school, up until I was 30, most of my fear was illness was around illness and dizziness and brain tumors and things like that. So I, dizziness and I don't get along. So, uh, the morning, um, the morning of, uh, the, the last morning of our trip, I woke up in the morning and started to get up and felt like I was going to pass out. The room was spinning everything. And I laid back down and I got a ton of anxiety around that. And I'm just going to be candid with you all. And my girlfriend's on here watching now, but, um, I got really anxious. Um, I thought I was going to pass out. I didn't know what was wrong with me. My mind started racing. I started having tons and tons and tons of OCD thoughts around um, everything from what could this be? Was I in the lake? Did I swallow something? Was there a bacteria in my brain? Um, every thought you can imagine to, to like, oh my God, I'm going to be stuck here. I can never get out. I'm going to die here because the hospital's far away. It was just the racing thoughts were absolutely insane. And, and, and also the discomfort of what was actually happening, the history of having had dizziness uh, as, as, a, as a result of my anxiety and OCD and, and that coming back up for me, that made me feel 12 years old again. It made me feel like I didn't have skills or tools, like I was like a little boy, um, you know, and it went, while it was a little dizzy spell or uncomfortable, I was responding to, to history in the past. And above all, it was in front of somebody that, um, that I'm getting to know and that I, I have a lot of feelings for. Um, but you know, to be honest, I don't want her to see me, uh, weak or struggling. Um, you know, even have tears coming down my, my eyes because the discomfort was so uncomfortable and it brought up so much history for me. Um, so, so that was present too, and it was super uncomfortable and I'm just being really, really vulnerable with all of you right now, um, in this moment. And, and you know, it, it occurred for over maybe 15 minutes or so. And then she was a sweetheart and got me something to drink. And like, I, I was able to sit up and took it a step, one step at a time. And my mind was screaming, don't sit up. You're going to die. It was all this stuff. What ended up happening was, you know, I, I, it went away. I started to feel better. I packed up the house. We packed up the house. I loaded the car, got sweaty, did some physical activity and drove three hours home. And, 
and uh, and was okay and went to bed that night and got another vertigo attack. So I'm going to go see a doctor tomorrow. But my point is, is that is that um, it's scary. It's scary to go outside your comfort zone. It's scary to face things that either have scared you in the past or scare you now or or just have uncomfortable feelings that you can't explain or you don't know the why. Not knowing the why is really scary for us. Um, we want to know why. That gives us certainty as to what's happening. Am I dizzy because it's a, it's just a one-off weird thing? Because Or do I have some terrible illness? I don't, I don't, I don't know what the answer is. Um, and even doing this live stream is out of my comfort zone right now. I, I, I have this vertigo thing going on. You know, part of me really just wants to lay in bed and just pretend it's not happening and feel safe and and not put myself out there. Um, you know, but at the same time, um, I need this for me and you need this for you and we need this for each other and we need to support each other. And if I'm going to act in accordance with my values, in accordance with my therapy, and in accordance with acceptance commitment therapy, which is in this moment, right now, can I function? Can I talk? Am I dizzy? Can I sit up straight? Can I look at a computer screen? If the answer is yes to all of those things, even though in the back of my mind, I'm wondering what's going to happen, I'm wondering what the doctor is going to say, all of this stuff, then the answer is I should be here right now with you doing what I do until I have more information that'll inform next steps or whatever. And so I'm here. And I'm in no way saying that to be commended or patted on the back. I'm saying that because this is about comfort zones and getting out of your comfort zone and doing in a, working in accordance with your value. And I know for a fact that if I decided not to do this tonight, you would have understood. And maybe some anxiety would, would have been relieved on my end. But I would have gone to bed feeling terrible that I knew in my heart of hearts I could have pulled through it and done it with you guys and spent some time. But I chose not to because I was scared of what if, what if right? The future, the anxiety, the anticipatory anxiety, all the things, you know, now there's validity in actually being sick in the moment and not being able to sit up straight and not being able to talk. And if that were the case, we wouldn't be having this conversation, but it's not the case. So the question then becomes, what am I willing to sit with? Um, am I willing to sit with the thoughts and the fears and maybe some uncomfortable feelings to be able to live into my values and have a meaningful conversation with all of you? So those are two quick examples of, of sort of things that I'm dealing with in the moment. Um, I'm optimistic that it is what it is and I'll figure it out and be fine. But it, it, I look back on my vacation and it was amazing regardless of that little blip. I, I look back on the last few days and I've been very productive regardless of how I felt. And, and that's why, you know, it's not about the feelings. It's about the action and what you do with it. And you can feel crappy and have a great day at the same time. Um, so I'm very curious. I haven't scrolled down to any comments yet. Um, and I'm sure you're commenting on what I'm talking about, which I'll get to. I apologize for talking so long. Um, but I hope that you find um, my transparency and, and vulnerability in what I'm going through right now um, helpful in your own journeys because we're in this together and it isn't easy. And I don't always make the right choices. Um, I don't always make the right choices. Sometimes I will avoid or sometimes I will compulse. I'm not perfect. Um, but I'd like to say that in the last 10 years, I've made way more value-driven choices than OCD anxiety-based choices. And that's really what it's at. It's not about being perfect. It's not about doing it right, doing it right all the time. It's simply about making, having more good days than bad, as I always like to say, therefore making more healthy, good, value-driven choices than, than, than not. And constantly challenging yourself and being willing to put yourself out there, even though it may end in a way that you may not like it. So um, I look forward to reading your comments about what I talked about and your questions as well. So if you have questions, we have 35 minutes. Let's get into it. Plus three minutes that I'll give you back for the tech difficulties. Um, so let's get into it. Let me do some scrolling real quick. Um, let's see here. Um, okay, Nick, I got you, I got you, friend. Uh, how do you determine at 7.07 p.m., Nick Toff asks, how do you determine your values then turn them into actions? Will following values come with less pain and suffering? That's a great question. That's a great question, Nick. And, um, you know, when you're in the midst of OCD and struggling with OCD, it can be really difficult to determine what your values are um, because you're in the, in the, in the trenches. Um, values are lifelong. Values are lifelong um, um, aspirations, dreams, 
things that are meaningful and moral to you that you can't accomplish or finish. They are literally lifelong. For instance, health is a value. Going to the gym weekly, that's a goal. Goals lead to values. Values are what drives goals. And we, we use goals to achieve our values and maintain them throughout our lives. So loving is a value. Um, learning is a value. Health, mental health is a value. Giving back is a value. Wanting to be a, um, an upstanding citizen is a value. And then how do you get there? And those are goals. So determining your values and turning them into actions, the actions would be the goals. There's, you can do some great, um, some great exercise on value decision. Uh, and, and, um, I'm trying to think there's a great workbook. Um, I don't think I have it. It is the, it's Kristen Neff and it's the self-compassion workbook or the mindfulness self-compassion workbook. And there's some great work on, um, on values and finding values and identifying your own values. And, uh, and then using goals to achieve those values. So if my value is to become physically healthy, what goals can I then set for myself? Well, I'm going to go to the gym. And you want to get really specific with your goals. So if you're going to schedule out goals for a week, you don't want to say, I'm going to work out this week. You want to say at 2 p.m. on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, I'm going to go for a walk from 2 to 3 p.m. and I'm going to walk X miles. Um, but will following values come with less pain and suffering? That's a really interesting um statement. And the answer to that question is in the short term, no. In the short term, it'll probably be even more painful and you'll suffer more because you're not listening to OCD. And OCD gets pissed when you don't listen to OCD. Um, and it tends to flare up and get angry, just like when you're doing ERPs. ERP is a value-based modality of treatment, as is acceptance commitment therapy. It's, it's, um, it's exposure-based, but it's value-based. It's all about following what's important to you and not what's important to the OCD. So by defining the OCD in the beginning, it's going to piss it off. But in the long term, absolutely, it comes with way less pain and suffering because you're essentially disempowering the OCD and the anxiety and you're giving power to who you are as an individual and as a person. And you're giving power to the things that you're important. Now, if you are struggling with your OCD, and sometimes the OCD can get so loud in the depression, if you have the OCD, uh, depression with your OCD can get so um, messy and loud that you're having a hard time determining or even remembering what your values are. A really interesting exercise that I've done and it works quite well is if you take the OCD, if you imagine whatever your OCD theme is, is a rope, and you follow that rope back up to the top, typically OCD the top of that rope is your value because OCD always attacks the things that we love most. And so some, some really interesting ways to re-identify with your values is follow the trail of your OCD breadcrumbs and see where it backs, it leads you back to. For instance, you know, if you're having um, se sexual thoughts about a child, you know, you can follow that back to love of children or, or wanting to teach or um, wanting to give back. Um, you know, family is a value. If you have a fear of, of potentially contaminating or harming a family member, um, you can actually use your OCD against itself and follow those breadcrumbs back to what those values are. Um, but following your values absolutely comes with less pain and suffering in the long run. And honestly, what is the alternative? You know, what is the, um, what is the alternative? The alternative is listen to OCD anxiety. So it is absolutely worth it. I can tell you um, from my own personal experience and, and many others here can tell you that, um, you know, turning your values into action through goals and through not listening to OCD and then, and then um, the results of those long-term. So that's a great question, Nick. Thank you for that. Um, so Paramesh and in India, I uh, Paramesh, I'm sorry. I hope I'm saying that right. It's 4.30 in the morning. I have OCD, how to manage rumination from pure O. Give some examples of your own. Thank you, Ethan. So um, I like, it's, it's, it's a great question. Um, thank you so much also for tuning in so early in the morning. Um, I would probably need a little bit more information in terms of, you know, the rumination. So, you know, and, and, but, the an the short answer is exposure response prevention. It applies to any subtype of OCD. So whether that's tapping, counting, or sexual violent intrusive thoughts. Um, so um, you know so some examples of my own are embracing the rumination, for instance. So if I had a fear, let's say that you know I was afraid that I was going to accidentally kill my mother. What if I want to kill my mother? Then 
you know, playing that into my head about maybe I do want to, and maybe that's okay. And, and maybe I am that person sitting with that discomfort. Um, I would, I would check out. And again, without having more details, it's hard to sort of give you some examples of how to um, specifically uh, address that in, in a way that would be, you know, exposure response prevention. Um, but, you know, if you're having specific thoughts, those are the obsessions, pure O, is, and then the compulsions is the rumination itself and trying to replay whatever it is um, or continue to think about it until you feel more comfortable. Um, so I would actually urge you to go to the iocdf.org website or you can go to peaceofmind.com. Um, there's a lot of good content on, um, on sexual violent intrusive thoughts and, and, um, and, uh, and mental, mental rituals and mental compulsions. And, um, and also I always give off, give out my email at the end and you're welcome to email me and we can talk more about it, but without having more detail, it's kind of hard to, hard to go into your, uh, specific example. Um, but hopefully, um, you asked for, uh, one of my own examples, um, you know, a, a, a mental example of, of when I was at the lake was, is the snake going to bite me and kill me? And my head was playing out. I, the snake was going to come up. It was going to bite my leg. I was going to go into you know, venomous shock or whatever it is. That's not a real thing. I just made it sound like a real thing, but uh, I was going to go into a shock and drown and all this thing. So what did I do? I accepted the fact that that might happen and live with the uncertainty and got in the water anyway. Um, that's kind of how I dealt with my own intrusive thought about, about that particular situation. Um, but everybody has a separate, um, you know, a separate way to, to cope. And there are a variety of ways to cope though. Exposure response prevention is obviously the gold standard of treatment. So I would ask you to, to look into that. And of course you can email me as well. I'll give that email out at the end of the session. Um, Grace, in regards to tackling ERP for harm OCD, how do you balance going out of your comfort zone for the sake of ERP treatment, but not overstepping personal values? I, I, e oh, sorry, Jess, this is a 7, 11 PM Grace. Um, i.e. intrusive thoughts around sharp objects and self and self others hope this question makes sense yeah it makes tons of sense um and I, i'll reiterate just to um i think what you're asking is you know balancing going out of your comfort zone for the sake of erp but not overstepping personal values i'm, I'm wondering if you mean personal values or, or getting too close to where it feels actually dangerous um you said intrusive thoughts around sharp objects and self and others hope this question makes sense um I would say if, 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 you're, if you're working with a therapist, um, I would trust the clinician 100%. I think that anything that they do with ERP feels uncomfortable out of your comfort zone and probably questions your values and morals and anything else. It feels, it feels, it feels wrong. But we know that we have to fight fire with fire, and sometimes we have to get really uncomfortable. We have to um, engage in treatment and therapy with the understanding that our clinician, our therapist, is working for us. They're not. They're not trying to get us killed. They're not trying to hurt us. They're not trying to to make our lives worse. They're trying to make our lives better. And if we hold hold ourselves to that truth and that belief that our clinicians and therapists want the best for us, then then we should also be willing to go outside of what we deem safe and might be morally questionable because our OCD is going to trick us. Our OCD is going to make us think that this is way too out for our comfort zone, that this is crossing the line, that, that a normal person wouldn't do this. And this is, this is actually dangerous and I shouldn't be doing this. Um, OCD is going to say all of those things. So I think having a, a level of trust in your therapist and clinician to be able to uh, tackle your exposures um, in a way that, that, you know, are safe, which, the, you know, if you're working with a trained professional should be safe, even if they seem unsafe because your OCD is screaming at you, for instance, your sharp objects. So I'll run with that. You know, um, are you afraid you're going, do you have to, for an ERP, um, hold, hold a knife to your neck or hold a knife to your therapist's neck or walk behind a family member with a knife or, or I've seen a lot of those things in various ERPs. And, and, you know, if, if that's the case, then again, trusting in this process of what exposure response prevention is, and also recognizing that, you know, our own thoughts around what's moral and our values might be slightly distorted by the OCD and doing a gut check with our therapist and letting our therapist help us determine what's in line with our values and goals and morals. It's okay to get a second opinion in that while the OCD is distorting um, the truth per se. So I hope that helps answer some of the question. Um, and Grace, you can, you can email me and talk more about it. I think it's a great question. Um, 
I know when I was in treatment, I had self-harm OCD. I was constantly afraid I was accidentally going to kill myself. Everything my therapist made me do made me feel completely irresponsible and against my values. I had to put pills in my mouth. I had to go home and quote unquote, try to kill myself. Um, I, I don't like saying that without context, but it was part of my therapy. Um, obviously I wouldn't try to kill. Anyway, um, for those of you that are watching, don't do that. <laughs> it's, um, it was part of my exposure unique to what I was going through, but Grace, I know you understand what I'm talking about. So um, all of that seems super counterintuitive to what I deemed um, value-driven and moral and safe, um, but at the end of the day, it, it helped me get better. And so, um, you know, really gut checking, what are your personal values and, and, and checking in with your treatment team is really helpful in that regard. I hope that helped answer. Um, Let's see here. At 7.11 p.m., hey, do uh, I've managed to work through current obsessions and compulsions of the present. Any advice when obsessions shift from present to the past? Rumination on what ifs and things that could have been. Uh, that's at 7.11 p.m. also. Um, I'm just going to stay right here. And so it's like I'm wearing, look, I, it's like I'm protected from COVID, right? I'm wearing, I'm wearing a comment mask. That, that's, is that funny or is that really not appropriate? Anyway, I'm sure I'll get yelled at later about it. Um, this is a great question. Um, the, the short answer is, <laughs> thank you, Jess. The short answer is um, you you deal with it the exact same way you deal with it before. It's all exposure response prevention. No matter the symptom, it's exposure response prevention. So so when it, when a symptom shifts, either either from symptom to symptom or from present to the past, and and what ifs about what could have been, it's still accepting of the uncertainty of maybe it would have been that way. Maybe it wouldn't have been that way. I'll never know. All I have is now in the present and moving forward. So that's what I'm going to focus on. Right? So it's living with the discomfort of the possibility of the future that you could have had, or the possibility of the past that you might've had and what could have happened or might've happened or might not have happened. And just living with the reality of the situation what didn't happen, accepting that, no matter how uncomfortable that is, and then focusing on where you are now and what you can do moving forward. Um, I relate to a lot of this. Um, I definitely spent a lot of my 30s wishing I could go back. Um, I, I don't know if you mean this specifically, but I know for me, ruminating on um, what life would have been like without OCD, the things that I would have accomplished, the things I would be, where I would be in my career, the things I would be doing, um, all that stuff, you know? And, and at the end of the day, I know it's obvious you can't go back, but it doesn't feel obvious. It, 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 it's easy to get stuck in the past and, 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 and live there and ruminate about all of the, all of the what ifs and the things that could have been. I relate to things that could have been. And also people ruminate in the past about what if I accidentally killed somebody or what if I hurt a child? You know, it's all anxiety exists in the past or the future does not exist in the present. What you worried about happening or what you're worried about may have happened. But it's all at the end of the day, living with the uncertainty and living with the understanding that it is what it is. And all you can do is move, move forward and embrace. Also, I will say that we don't have clarity on the past. It's easy for us to assume or believe that if X hadn't have happened, that all of this would have played out in a certain way. Oh, hey, Meg Sizemore. I'm glad you're here. All of this would have played out in a certain way. But the reality is we don't have that insight. We don't know that. For instance, in my mind, for many years, I believed, well, if I didn't have OCD, then I would have moved out to LA when I was 18. I would have started movies when I was 20. I would have been successful by 22. I would have been directing by 24 and blah, 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 and so on and so on. Or I could have get, got hit by a bus crossing the street getting a bangle at 19 and done none of that stuff. So the reality is we think we have a very clear idea of how the past may have gone if, but we truly have no idea what the past would have happened if. All we can do is really um, be thankful for the person the past has made us now because there's so many lessons from the pains of the past. Um, and as much as I was in pain for most of my OCD struggle, I am, and anybody who hears me talk or talks to me knows I am insanely grateful for where I am today, the friends that I have, the community that I'm talking to right now. Um, and, and that, you know, although I don't want to go back, I wouldn't change any of it. Um, because it's made me the individual who I am today. And, and I am grateful for that. And I am taking, um, I'm taking that. I am taking the 31 years of, of pain and suffering and struggle and then anything else I've struggled with in addition in the, in the last, you know, 12 years. And I'm taking that with me and moving, moving forward, you know, and continuing to grow. But um, you would treat it like any other obsession. Um, 
let's see here. Uh, people left some great comments, so please read through. I want to make sure I get to everybody's questions, and then I'll I'll come back around to the comments. Um, let's see here, I'm right here. I'm right there with you about the lake fears. Thank you, Yvonne. It's I, like in a pool, nothing's going to come up from under me. It's like it's it's I can see the bottom, and it's blue, and blue is safe water. Brown is not safe water. I don't know if that's true, but I don't know. Blue blue was is safe water. And, and, and there's a lifeguard and, and this is like just nature-y and brown and there's, there's bugs and, and, and fish. And, uh, I mean, I don't know, fish could be strong. I don't, I don't know what I'm dealing with here. So, um, you know, <laughs> so, uh, so Yvonne, I, you and I will go on vacation next time and you and I will stay on a pool or one of those water fred natural spring, like Fiji lakes. I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. Katie wrote it wasn't that outdoorsy. It was super outdoorsy. Don't make me call you out on the fact that you wouldn't go outside at night because of the bugs. <clears throat> I was willing to go outside because of the bugs. She wasn't. Uh, so, um, swam in, Thomas swam in lakes a ton, not dead yet. Oh, I should have called you first. Well, I'm still here. So, um, so, so far, so good. And I had a blast. I really did. I had a really great time. Um, increased self time. People, uh, this was in regards to my earlier comments about why you want to get out of your, comf uh, your, your comfort zone. Um, somebody wrote, you value your girlfriend. That's absolutely correct. I do value relationships and my girlfriend. Um, increased self-confidence. You're training your mind. You're okay. Um, and you're training your mind that you can also be okay not being okay. Regardless, you're training your mind that it's all worth it. Uh, I'm 32. I'm figuring that out. Ethan, how to live. Kira, thank you for that. Uh, Ashley wrote, pushing yourself to overcome is good for OCD. Absolutely. Uh, Caroline wrote, yes, I feel that values can be an amazing motivator. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Um, Ashley wrote, my my 15-month-old, let's see, my 15-month-old and being a mother is a huge motivator for me. Absolutely. Uh, Thomas, one swam up on our floating pad one time. It was just trying to get in the sun. I'm assuming you're talking about a water moccasin. They don't deserve sun, whatever. Uh, I deal with morning anxiety too, by the way. Vacations are absolutely great. Uh, and and, and Christine wrote, vacations for me are very stressful. And that's true. That is for a lot of people because it's a change of scenery. Change. Change in general is very stressful for people with anxiety and OCD. Just a given. So, you know, even though it was like there are absolutely aspects of it that that are stressful. And that's why, um, but at the end of the day, you know, they're amazing experiences that um, that we wouldn't change. Um, as always, the ding, the dang, I said dang. <laughs> the, the comments adjusted and I just lost my place. So if you won't would be so kind as to give me one second so I can find um, where I was. Uh, okay, there we are. Sorry about that. Um, so glad you had a great vacation. Thank you, Natalie. Um, Ethan, do you, uh, let's see here. Uh, PK at 7, 18 p.m. Oh, I got to get to these questions. Ethan, do you feel a sense of empowerment whenever you successfully challenge your OCD? By the way, if you guys want to go 10 minutes later, I'm fine with that. Jess may kill me. Um, um, but, uh, if you can actually leave, uh, you can't leave, but, oh, Jess is going to yell at me right now. Um, oh, she said, it's fine. If you guys just leave in the comments, if you want to stick around for 10 more minutes, this is a good conversation. Um, I'm happy to stick around and have a little bit longer conversation with you guys. If you have questions. Um, so do you feel a sense of empowerment whenever you successfully challenge your OCD? Absolutely. 1 million percent. Um, I don't think there's been a time um, where I haven't felt a sense of empowerment, uh, when I challenge my OCD, I can tell you that, uh, challenging your OCD is very empowering and, um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that the, the, the empowering feeling happens in the moment. Um, in fact, you know, challenging your OCD in the moment is, is very anxiety provoking and triggering. Um, but deep down there's a, there's an intense, um, sense of empowerment. And especially, um, as the day goes on, um, you become very, very proud of yourself and, and, as you go through the process of engaging an ERP and challenging your OCD, you look forward to being able to challenge it. Uh, when it pops up, you really see it as a great opportunity to punch it in the face and just say, you know, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to listen to you. Um, and it really becomes, um, it really becomes second nature. Um, I know when you're in treatment and therapy, um, it feels very hard to, to fight OCD and it feels like, am I going to have to fight this hard the rest of my life? And the answer is no, you don't. Um, you know, you get to a place where ERP and challenging your OCD really becomes second nature and almost involuntary. I do it all the time and I don't always know I'm doing it. I just do. And that's an amazing place to be. And so, yes, to the sense of empowerment um, when you challenge your OCD. Also, when you challenge your OCD right off the bat, it dies very quickly. I'm not necessarily saying when you're in the in the heat of therapy 
or treatment, but definitely um, at, over the last 10 years when I've noticed new thoughts that I've never had or new symptoms. For instance, I was driving one time. I've never had hit and run an OCD. I've never up to that point hit a bump and thought I accidentally hit someone. I was leaving my therapist's office. I hit a bump and I thought, oh my God, I just hit someone. And I knew it was an OCD thought, but I'd never had that thought before, which then convinced me that, well, it must be real because I, I, don't, I don't have that OCD. Um, and I really wanted to look in the rearview mirror, uh, but I told myself, I'm not going down that road. I'd rather go back to, I'd rather go to jail than, than listen to my OCD. I'm pretty certain it was in an OCD voice where I heard it. So I didn't look in the rearview mirror and probably in five to 10 seconds, I had completely forgotten about it. It really puts the fire out quick. Um, and so to answer your question, yes, yes, absolutely. And I encourage all of you to, to challenge your OCD as much as possible. Um, Katie, thanks for living into your values with me last week. Proud of you. And you always inspire me to live into mine. Thank you. That thank I never had, I, I said, thank you. Like businessy. Well, thank you, Katie. That's very kind of you, but thank you. I'm not, I don't, I don't know how to take that yet, but thank you. Uh, it's really interesting when you meet someone that really understands you, um, and understands, um, and, and loves you for, for, uh, for all of you and, and you don't have to hide pieces of you. Um, it's, it's a new experience for me. Um, and I'm, I'm just, it's weird to talk about in public, but whatever, it's a new experience for me. And, um, it's, it's, it's amazing. And that's also being out of your comfort zone, being willing to go down that road with somebody and show them pieces of you that you may, you may think or deem ugly or disgusting, but in fact, they're who you are and, and, and that's okay. And, and it's, it's, it's very empowering. Um, I'm glad Patricia and Yvonne are talking. Uh, please give yourselves credit. I'm okay. I, I have a lot of superstitions, OCD, and superstition. Well done. Thank you for sharing. My pleasure. You're welcome. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, Natalie Diaz, I find my health, anxiety, OCD thoughts tend to increase when I am somewhere more remote, far from a hospital. Absolutely. When I was a kid and my parents took me on road trips, I, I always looked for the nearest hospital. Um, always, always, always. And, and like, didn't see it. I made them go by it. And if I saw an ambulance and that was a sign that I was going to have to be in an ambulance, Yes, I totally feel you on that. Um, appreciate your vulnerability. Super relatable. Your strength is empowering. Thank you so much, Caroline. Um, I drink a ton of water, Yvonne. Maybe I am dehydrated, but I doubt it. Um, I'm I'm hoping for something way worse. We'll, we'll never know. But thank you, Yvonne. I know what you're doing. Uh, Anissa, you're so brave and open and compassionate, Ethan, for sharing the story. And so good you have someone to share your life with. Thank you, Anissa. I really appreciate that. Um, hi, Luciana. I'm having a really hard time and seeing the bright side while having pure OCD. Um, we can talk about that in a moment, Luciana. Um, if I did not have my dog, I would never leave my apartment. Ethan, I have the same issues about sickness. I could write a book once in a while. I have it occasionally. Never knew it was OCD until last year. Lois, I'm so sorry that you just found out it was OCD last year, but you just found out it was OCD. So the good news is that you can, you know, there are things to do, and I think that's that's really um, exciting. And you should be very, very optimistic. It's it's never, ever, ever too late to to take back your life for sure. So. Um, I, I feel very, um, without knowing too much about your, your experience or circumstances, I feel very optimistic for you. Um, PK, I think it's important to do something each week outside of your comfort zone, no matter how small. I totally agree with you. In fact, I had a talking point that I didn't get to, but basically saying that very thing, like it's okay to be comfortable. It's okay to be in a place, um, you know, where, where things are going good and you're in a groove and you're in a routine, but I, I definitely like to get out of my comfort zone. Um, once a week. And it feels good. You feel alive. You feel like you accomplished something. Um, and, and who knows where it leads because that growth happens. So, um, I love that PK. And also Luciana, a lot of people are commenting as always, everybody's advocating for everybody else. I think that's awesome. Um, so please everyone read the comments. Um, uh, Lizzie, I have never known anyone in person with severe health anxiety, and I feel so alone. I wouldn't wish it on anyone. Lizzie, I'm sorry. Um, we have, if you go to, um, well, first of all, I had very severe health anxiety. Are we, we're kind of in person. For COVID, we're in, as in person as we can get. So I am your first uh, friend, perhaps. Um, so I'm glad, I'm glad we're friends, Lizzie. Um, but health anxiety is super tough, and it's extremely tough right now with everything going on. So I would try to grant yourself some grace and compassion. Um, I'm sure some people will respond to you in this comment thread, um, but also um, there's some amazing communities that you can access to, to be able to talk. There's Facebook groups, there's Instagram influencers that talk a lot, not, I hate that word influencers, but they're Instagram accounts to follow that talk about. Um, you can go to Health Unlocked, which is the uh, IOCDF's um, support community. 
um, and, and talk to tons of people that have health anxiety. Same if you download the NOCD app, they have a huge community where you can talk to a lot of other people with health anxiety. It's very, it's very common, it's super uncomfortable, um, and I wouldn't wish it on anyone either, but I, I, I can at least let you know that you can get over it and you can get better. Um, I am proof of that. And, um, and, uh, and if you want, actually, if you want to email me, Lizzie, um, at, I'll just give it out. It's just Ethan at IOCDF.org. Um, and we'll give it out again at the end. But if you want to email me, I, I know a couple, um, advocates that also have health anxiety and it'd be my pleasure to introduce you. If you think that would be beneficial for you, I think it would be, um, uh, Lois, we are a community together to support each other. Years ago, we didn't know that much and could communicate like this so wonderful. You're absolutely right, Lois. Um, I'm a parent of a 20-year-old with intense OCD. I really got, get so much from it listening to this. He has a therapist from McLean, and she definitely has her hands full. <laughs> Sandra, I, I was at McLean, and I gave all my therapists there a handful, uh, which is why I got kicked out of McLean. But he's in a great spot, um, and, uh, and and you know it's it's an amazing opportunity to really get a handle on, on the OCD. So. Uh, I'm, he's in the right place. So that's, that's wonderful to hear. Um, Ashley, I feel like I've stayed in my job for too long because it's comfortable, even though I want and need a change. You know, Ashley, that's, that's, I would be really compassionate about that. I think that, you know, a job and money and, and security and safety is, is a hard thing to walk away from. And at the same time, you know, you may be combating a, a desire for change or a need for change. And I think that's something, if you're saying it out loud, maybe that's something to explore. And I'd be proud of myself for exploring that. It looks like you have a daughter in the picture. Uh, your Facebook picture, so I'm sure you're dealing with a lot of a lot of things that you have to weigh when you're making a big choice like that. So you know, definitely dig deep. But you know, sometimes change is really, really, really good. Um, hi, Margaret. Margaret's here. Peace of mind. And peace of mind. What am I saying? Riley's Wish, um, awesome nonprofit. Uh, really tackles substance use disorder and uh, and OCD. Uh, Margaret is the executive director. It was founded on uh, because of her son who um, who passed from an accidental overdose. Um, anyway, Margaret Sisson is an amazing advocate, dear friend, and we always like to support Riley's Wish when we can. Um, sorry, I'm looking for questions. I apologize. P uh, PK at 720 says, say, asks, Ethan, would you say that once, that since learning to manage your OCD, you have experienced the most fulfilling years of your life? PK, I love your questions. They're so positive. Oh my gosh, I love your questions. Okay. So this is such a great question. And the answer is emphatically, wholeheartedly, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Not to say that there weren't meaningful parts of my life uh, before this, um, but what I can tell you, and I talk a little bit about it um, in some documentaries and some articles is, you know, when I was in Boston sort of getting better, um, I started experiencing joy for the first time. And what I can tell you about, you know, um, since learning to manage my OCD is, is um, the ability to live in the present moment and enjoy the things that I'm doing presently. Um, I'm not in the present moment all the time, but the ability to enjoy whatever it is and be present in that moment and experience uh, feelings like joy, to feel peace and serenity, which are things that I never thought in a million years I would ever, 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 ever feel. Um, but to be able to sit still and be present and, and feel nature and feel emotion come from that, um, is, is a gift. I don't even, I, I can't even comprehend. And I'm honestly grateful every single day that I get to feel it and experience those things. Because when you don't have that and you live without that, um, it's a very profound experience to then live a life that you, you experience, um, uh, uh, so much, uh, joy and excitement and, um, emotions that when you're really suffering and struggling, you see other people go through and you're jealous and you feel like you're never going to be that person. You're never going to experience those things, those feelings. This weekend was a perfect example of that. This past week, I experienced things that I, I, I never thought I would experience, um, but I saw it in other people and other couples. And when I was really sick, I was very envious of, 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 of seeing people do things that in my head, I would say, oh, I'll never have that. I'll never have that. that that'll never be me. Um, and, and boy, was I wrong. Um, and, 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 um, it, it, it was, it's me and it can be you and I'm stuttering cause I'm emotional, but, but it, it, it can be you, it, it can be all of you. Um, you know, the real magic PK and frankly, all of you, the real magic to this whole, um, therapy with OCD is, 
is the real the real magic from the treatment comes honestly in that last five percent that hierarchy that that last bit where you're really willing to let go and where you're really willing to um let the scary things happen and embrace the uncertainty fully and wholeheartedly um i think a lot of people with ocd including myself for many many years lived in a place of negotiation where you know after some therapy i was functioning well enough um, that i didn't feel like i needed to do any more but i was still struggling and still not perfectly happy and for me um that sort of last five to ten percent of 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 treatment and getting better was really where the magic was because when you're not functioning you and, and you do treatment and therapy and you get to functioning then you're functioning and that's great that's great functioning is much better than laying in bed and not functioning at all but i didn't know that there was another step because my whole life was made up of functioning and not functioning that's all my life was until i was 31 i was either up and doing something i was miserable but i was doing it or i was not functioning at all so i had no idea that there was this whole thing called joy and happiness and feelings and um and serenity and peace and experience and and present living and moments i didn't even know that existed until um until i really was forced to to buy into erp and act and all the modalities I'll do treatment wholeheartedly and just with my full heart and soul and be willing in my, in my case, be willing to have a brain bleed and hit my head and swallow all the things that I was afraid of fully embrace the idea that one day all of it may happen. Um, but I don't care. I'm going to live in the present moment and live with the chance that it may happen. And when I did that, um, man, it all opened up and I, I, I got it. I really got that, 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 that last stretch of hierarchy, that last, um, surrender to to uh, to the treatment um, is where the whole fulfilling that word fulfilling comes into play, and it really is it's completely game changing. Um, and and it's part of the reason um, I work so hard to stay well now, and part of the reason I'm willing to be um, I'm willing to ignore my OCD no matter how scary it is because I'm just I don't want to lose what I've gotten. I, it's not worth it to me to lose it. And I'm in no way saying you've heard me talk before. I have. OCD thoughts, I have compulsions. I'm not saying I don't do that. All I'm saying is, um, you know, when push comes to shove, more times than not, I'll choose the discomfort over the OCD because um, um, life is is honestly precious and amazing. And I don't say that with I, I don't I don't say that with any time. I say that with the utmost humility to all of you. Um, I really believe that all of us can reach this, and that's why I do what I do. So that's a great question. Sorry to ramble on that. Thank you, PK. I appreciate that. Um, hi, Nikki Bradley in Dublin. I hope you're awesome. Uh, Caroline, with OCD themes like moral screw, how do you balance walking towards your values and exposures, but also feeling like exposures contradict your values because of the nature of obsessions? Caroline, I'm not deflecting your question. We actually did three recent town halls on moral scrupulosity that covers so much of that, so much better than I could ever reiterate. So if you want to go to the uh, IOCDF Facebook or YouTube pages, you'll see moral screw volumes one, two, and three. They are uh, three 90-minute with, with John Hirschfeld and Patrick McGrath, all we talk about is moral scrupulosity. We answer that question in a variety of ways. Of course, you can always email me a specific question, but I would ask you to, to go there. And it's really, really, really good um, town halls and great watching. Um, Anthony, thank you very much. Ethan, great pep talk. Having some difficulty now as I'm listening. God help, bless us all. Um, it's 7.59. If, if, if you guys are cool and want to stick around, um, let's go 10 more minutes. Jess said it was okay. Um, so why don't we just try and get through a few more questions if we can. Um, so uh, thanks very much. Uh, sorry. Hi from Houston, Texas. I'm a mom of a 13 year old son with OCD just right. He was on the IOP and still struggling. He thinks uh, too much in this pandemic has been difficult, but I think he is comfortable with it. That, that I think, I think that uh, I was born in Houston. Not that that has anything to do with what you were asking. Um, you know, 13 is a difficult age and I think that's great. He has skills and tools at the IOP and still struggling is okay too. He has a foundation and you know, I would I would have patience. It's it's a process. Getting better from this is a process, and 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 it's difficult times right now. So um, you know, be patient and be consistent. And uh, you're in a good position because you are. He's 13. He's he's a minor, and you're a parent. So you know, um, if you have questions on maybe places you can go from from here now that he's been released from IOP and maybe struggling a little bit, be happy to point you in a direction or maybe offer some advice that you might find helpful. You're welcome, Nick. Of course. Um, Yvonne struggling with fear of getting COVID can't leave the house and wash my hands so much. They're starting to peel. Uh, Vaughn, I'm so sorry. Um, I think everybody's experiencing some sense of that. Um, and you know, I would urge you to challenge, um, 
or if you're doing any type of remote treatment or remote therapy or virtual teletherapy, um, I think that could be very helpful, of course. And of course, you can always email me as well. Um, Christine, do you ever dream about your OCD obsessions? I have vivid dreams from having a bad episode. That's interesting. Um, I mean, I have dreams about, I have COVID dreams lately. Last night I dreamt that I went to Walmart without a mask and it was packed. And then I realized while I was in the crowd that I wasn't wearing the mask and I freaked out. Um, but I don't know that I've ever dreamt specifically about my OCD obsessions, but I don't think, I, I would seriously doubt that's uncommon. I think that, you know, whatever's currently on your mind will be present in your dreams. So I think that's, that's something that probably a lot of people can relate to. Um, uh, Nissa, would you please repeat the name of the workbook you mentioned on self-compassion and goals? I cannot recommend, I'm going to Google this real quick. So, um, Kristen. Okay. It's the mindful self-compassion workbook, a proven way to accept. Um, let me just put this Google search in the private chat. So Jess can, Oh, that's a terrible link. Sorry, Jess. Um, but it's the mindfulness workbook by Kristen Neff. I can't tell you it's been such a game changer for me in the last three years in terms of just um, embracing uh, who I am, learning about self the language of self-compassion and values and identifying the critic inside of me and um, how I talk to myself and how negatively I talked to myself before. Um, it, it really has been quite game changing. I can't recommend it enough. It comes in a book form and then it comes in a workbook form. And I found the workbook form to be unbelievably helpful. Um, Luciana, how would you proceed if the what if thoughts start messing with you? For example, if my values change in the future somehow, that's so scary and leaves you frightened. You know, Luciana, you don't need to put that up. You know, the, the quick answer is uncertain. It's, it's still living with the uncertainty um, that that may happen. But, you know, look at where you are now. How is OCD impacting your life? You can always go back to ritualizing and compulsing. But, you know, yes, that is possible that your values may change in the future or they may not. But what we know now is that you know, and I don't know your story, but, but what we know now is that OCD is probably impacting your life in some way. And, and you have two options. You can do something about it or not do something about it. And so I would be, I, I know, yes, absolutely. It's scary and leaves you frightened. Um, and that's for, for, for a many, many subtypes or symptoms. What if I get sick? What if I accidentally kill somebody? Uh, what if I change as a person? What if I accidentally do this? All of those things. Um, but at a certain point, we just have to be li willing to live with that. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. And, uh, and, and embrace the treatment. And in doing so, um, a beautiful life lays ahead for sure. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, Christine, during ERP, does your OCD obsession seem to stick with you longer? It's a great question. Uh, uh, 7.37 p.m., uh, uh, Jess, if that's your real name. I couldn't think of your name. Um, so... This is a quick, quick, quick answer. ERP uh, spike symptoms. So because it's 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 asking your OCD to come out. So the obsessions may in fact um, stick with you longer just because you're aggravating them. No different than scratching a mosquito bite, right? It makes the mosquito it makes it itch more. The ERP purposely draws the obsessions out so you have an opportunity to resist compulsing. That's the response prevention, right? And consistently, so you may be triggered longer. Your obsessions may stick around longer. Um, it's short term. Um, it's, it's, it, we always like to say in ERP, it gets worse before it gets better. Um, but over, as you consistently engage in ERP, um, the obsessions will continue, will, will go down and hopefully, you know, almost go away for the most part, um, to where they're just small whispers. So, um, let's see here. I dwell so much on what I think I've done wrong. Yes. I feel like my addiction, you suggested for enlarging your comfort zone. Pat, Patricia, uh, I feel like my addiction and then the whole pandemic situation have caused my comfort zone to shrink substantially. Like I'm uncomfortable now with basic situation interactions that were once routine, feels like backsliding. Any suggestions for enlarging your comfort zone in the midst of new social distancing norms? That's a great question, Patricia. You know, um, I don't know, Jess, if you want to grab the tail end of that. Um, I think that, that we have to reassess um, what's normal and reassess um, what is basic situations and interactions and, and reassess our comfort zones. And then also um, look at, I, I see some, a little bit of judginess, Pat, in your, in your comment and saying that feels like you're backsliding things that I could do before that were easy are now more difficult because of everything that's going on. But everything that's going on is also very anxiety provoking. And so everybody's baseline is, has, has risen. And so, you know, I would, knowing you, and, uh, you know, I would, I would be, um, com more compassionate with myself 
be okay that maybe it's doing things that you, you know things that you once did before that were easier or a little bit more difficult that that's okay because i think that's everybody's situation right now i'm not marginalizing and i'm just saying that we're all going through some semblance of that and then maybe start doing small things even if they seem like oh i could, you know it's so easy to say um say if you went outside and got the mail and now going outside and got the get the mail scares you you know even though we never want to compare um, what we did before easily to what we can do now. So even though in the past it's like, oh, that was so easy, that's stupid, I should be able to do that now, why can I not do that, um, I know, I'm a loser, whatever that self-negative talk is, acknowledging that things are tough right now and okay, you could do it before and it's tough now, so making some of those things that you could do before into new small goals. Um, so um, I, I don't know uh, what an example, would be for you um, right now, but you know, I don't know if you're talking to people on the phone or if you can meet with somebody outside 10 feet away, you know, or, but in my mailbox example, it would be, don't judge the fact that you used to do it before and you can't do it now. Simply use it as an opportunity to make that a new goal and be like, you know what, this is hard for me right now. So I'm going to, tomorrow, I'm going to try to go get the mail and I'm going to see how far I can get to get the mail. And I'm going to walk out toward the mailbox. And if I get nervous, maybe I'll turn around and the next time I'll go a little bit further and a little bit further. So, you know, maybe the things that you could do before, but not can't do now, turn those into, um, turn those into, into little goals within the safety of what people are asking you to do. But Pat, try not to be so judgy on, on, um, you know, what you're struggling with. It's okay to, to struggle on things that might have been easier before. I mean, there are a million reasons why that happens. I know that there are things that I did when I'm 30 that kind of scare me now when I'm 40 and and so forth and so on. And it's okay. So I think we can you can take some of those things um and and re stretch your comfort zone back out by just picking one or two things that may be a little bit harder now. And if you can't do them because of social distancing, maybe try new creative ways of doing those things and then take it slow and step by step. Um, let's see here. Fish can bite and it's painful. That is true, Brie. I'm convinced that I did get pit, uh, bit by a, a fish, uh, one or two times. Um, comments just adjusted. I'm so sorry. Let me look back up. Okay. Here we go. Hello, Lisa coin. Okay. Um, fish can bite. There we go. Uh, all right. I remember you're from Houston area. You're telling us you've never gone to the lake or ocean. <laughs> I totally agree. Have the dizziness thing too, Ethan. I find it hard to stay hydrated. Can help pair with deep breathing to stay present. Good to hear. I'm not alone. You know what, Greg? I had, um, I mean, most of my somatic um, experience with OCD in, in, in middle school and high school was dizziness. Uh, my anxiety and OCD presented with dizziness and nausea. I was constantly dizzy and constantly nauseous. And I was convinced I had a brain tumor. And and that's why now when I get real, not not made up, real vertigo, or my it, it brings up a lot of that history and I start to feel what I was before and I start to beat myself up a bit. So I totally relate to that. Um, uh, Preeti, I'm listening for my son. Can I save this video so that he can hear it too? It will be a lifesaver for him. Absolutely. Uh, the video will live. It's being recorded. It will live um, on the IOCDF Facebook page and YouTube pages. Um, so um, so you can absolutely rewatch it with your son. Unfortunately, I can't get to all the questions. You guys were awesome tonight. Um, I really, really appreciate all the the back and forth. Um, um, so, so thank you. If I didn't get to your question, um, I'll, I'll give you, again my uh, email address again at the very end, and uh, you feel free to answer it. But this has been a great conversation. Uh, just scrolling down, Lois, Ethan, this is so empowering because of you. I would love to be an advocate when I retire in a couple of years. Just getting a little more comfortable with Pure O, which I had over fifty years. I totally understand that, Lois, and and thank you so much for the kind words. Um, advocating is, is an amazing experience. It, it's, I can tell you Lois that you just in the questions and the comments that you're leaving, you're already advocating. So congratulations, you're an advocate. Um, you know, you don't have to do it on a, on, on a, on a level like this, having a conversation with one other person, um, anybody who left a comment or, or a question is, is advocating. And so, um, and we'll do some future talk on advocacy if you guys want. So with that in mind, um, let me just get to some quick end things. I appreciate you guys sticking around for next, an extra 10 minutes. I hope that was helpful. Um, so tomorrow uh, night to uh, finish our, I think it's the last, is it the last Wednesday? No, we have one more. Uh, as a part of our Minority Mental Health Awareness Month, we have racism and OCD from 7 to 8.30 p.m. That will be also at the Facebook and YouTube IOCDF channels. And then Thursday, July 9th from 7 to 8.30, we will have the OCD 
substance use disorder uh, comorbid town hall. So if you struggle with um, substance use and OCD, uh, we have Patrick McGrath, we have Stacey Conroy, who's on here now, and, and Lindsay, uh, Lindsay Tierney um, will be joining us, and that will be a great conversation. So please, please tune in. As always, I want to thank the IOCDF and, of course, my partner behind the scenes, Jess, for being willing to stick around for an extra 10 minutes at taking a day, a night, some time. Woo! Words. Taking some time out of her night to, uh, to stick around with us. So thank you, Jess. Also, the conference regis registration is open. It's going to be dope. I don't know if dope is still a cool word. But it is going to be dope. We The IOCDF is working insane hours to make this as an amazing conference experience as possible virtually. I am doing a ton of work for it. We're all working really hard to give you as, as an in-personal experience as you can have uh, without actually having to be there. There's a gazillion talks and, and activities and, and speeches and celebrities and special guests and all kinds of things. So if you haven't registered for the conference, please, please, please go, you know, if you haven't been able to go, go to the conference in the past, this is such a great opportunity to get involved and, and, and check out the conference. So um, go to onlineocdconference.org to check out the details and register if you can. Lastly, if you haven't already and you want to be notified about all the programming the IOCDF is having over the next month, be sure to subscribe and follow on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. You can also check out the calendar on the IOCDF website of upcoming events and live streams. So that is everything. Um, I will be moderating, moderating the Thursday event. So if you'd like to tune in um, on, on Thursday, you will see me there as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll put up my email. If you have any questions, as always, don't hesitate to email me at justethan at iocdf.org. I will always get back to you. Um, have a wonderful night. Stay safe. Feel the feels. Don't let OCD off the hook. And we'll see you two weeks from tonight for another Just Ethan.